Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land. Every secret brotherhood, every secret society, every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. They do not believe in Lucifer. They do not believe in any entity called a devil, and they do not believe in God. It is a mistake for you to assume that they do. They are atheists in the strictest sense of the word. They are humanists. That's their religion. At the highest level, their goal is to create a world in which the adepts, the thousand points of light, working behind the veil to create the culmination of the great plan can realize the ultimate happiness for mankind. That's why they don't oppose pornography. That's why they don't oppose certain crimes. That's why they say you should not be put in jail for the rest of your life for murder or anything else. There should be no death penalty because it was a learning experience. <laughs> And having gone through that learning experience, you're a better person now. This is what they teach. They believe punishment for these crimes is nothing more than vengeful retribution, which is wrong in their eyes. So these are really the two philosophies that we have competing with each other in the world today. Who brought man a gift of fire? Prometheus. Who was Prometheus? Lucifer. What was the gift of fire? Knowledge. Intellect. Hasn't man created industry, culture, society, science from the use of one solitary thing? Fire. Without fire, none of it would have occurred. None of it. Nothing. There would be no society without fire. That's how it's represented in the ancient myths and in the mysteries. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is it represented as? A bolt of lightning struck a tree. The tree burst into flames. Ancient man, if you watch the movie Quest for Fire, rushed up and grabbed one of the burning branches and it burned his hand and he let it go. He probably didn't go any farther than that the first time. Second time he may have found a deer that had been roasted by the heat of the fire in the forest. And being hungry, maybe he partook of some of that meat and found that it tasted pretty good. Also, the fire was warm. It didn't get cold at night. This is where the whole battle between the forces of light and darkness comes from. Man sat upon a rock one night, watching the sunset, and said, Boy, I'm in deep trouble now. I can't see in the dark. There's wild beasts out there. There's tigers with teeth seven inches long that want me for dinner. What am I going to do? He didn't know what to do. Neither would many of us put in that situation. But we would know one thing, we're in deep trouble. Commissioner of Agriculture Andy Gibson tells me Memphis Meats is a company based out of California. And they're changing the way food is grown, transitioning from the farm to a petri dish. This summer, grocery stores across Mississippi will be selling an alternative meat product, engineered from a company called Memphis Meats. 
and they're changing the way food is made. They have perfected their program to cultivate, harvest animal cells, artificially feed them a high protein slime, and grow that into a food product that they were trying to label as meat. They're producing using the same kind of hormones that chickens normally produce to help grow, um, you know, grow and develop and just doing it in a petri dish. Some state leaders call it unnatural, so biologists say it's an advanced step towards further genetic modification. That we're talking about science fiction type material, growing meat from a hair follicle of a cow. It seems like it was kind of a science, science fiction type um, kind of thought in, in, in the past, but the you know, technology's gotten so much now that we're able to do this relatively like, easily. And there's still a lot of hurdles that the company can have to go through. One is the cost of the product. First, a uh, hamburger that was grown in the NPG was like $330,000 or something like that. It's ridiculous. Agriculture Commissioner Andy Gibson says another hurdle is the truth and labeling law. Missouri and Mississippi are the only states regulating the product in this way. Come July 1, we're going to make sure every product in our grocery stores across the great state of Mississippi. Uh, if the uh, meat is being sold, then in fact it's real meat. And if it's not meat, they can't call it meat. We reached out to Memphis Meats to learn more about their products. We haven't heard back. Jennifer Lot 16, WFP. So for a good part of his history, man sat huddled in the darkness in some place that made him feel secure, waiting to be saved. Now remember folks, I'm not telling you what I believe, I'm telling you what is taught in the mysteries, I'm telling you what our enemies believe. Make no mistake about it, they are our mortal enemies. They want to see us wiped off the face of the earth. A man huddled in this darkness, fearful, trembling, cold, hungry. And around about he could hear the beast roaring, and sometimes they were roaring because they were after him, and sometimes he was eaten. A man eventually saw another tree struck by lightning, and grabbed that branch with that flame on it, and by a little experimentation he learned how to keep that fire going. And if he could keep the fire going, he knew something nobody else knew, and he became the first king, the first priest. The first scientist, all rolled into one. And he would burn this fire and keep it going. Another man in the cold of the night, wanting to escape from the terrors that were out there, who gravitate toward this glow. And they would see this man sitting there. And if he was kind, he would let them come to the fire. And they would be warm. They would be protected, because if the wild beast came, he'd pick up a branch and shove it in its face, and the beast would go away. And so the forces of light overcame the forces of darkness, and in the sunshine of the morning, the newly risen, resurrected child that had died the night before, their Savior, warmed them and saved them from the terrors of the Prince of Darkness. You have to study these things to understand your enemy. Any general who ventures upon a battlefield without understanding the enemy is doomed to defeat. These people believe and they have conducted themselves according to their belief and their philosophy since the very dawn of man. These people learn how to control others through the use of a hidden knowledge. This ability to keep their fire going was a technology that nobody else knew. By observing the fire, by keeping it going, by creating ceremonies around this fire, they became a mystery to the others. A mystery always holds sway over those who don't understand it. And the priesthood was born. No king ever existed without the permission of the priesthood. I don't care what religion you're talking about or what period of history you're talking about, it is the truth. The 
kings never had the power and don't to this day. Kings exist at the whim of the real power, which is the priesthood standing behind the throne. And when the king ceased to be a benefit to the priesthood, they would simply poison him and get rid of him in some other way. The king is dead, long live the king, and there would be another king appointed. There was even a time in history when the king was a sacrificial king, just like John F. Kennedy was in the Temple of the Sun known as Dewey Plaza. They would pick a young man with the height of his virility appoint him king for one year. During that time, he could do or say or command whatever he wanted. The priesthood was always there to make sure he commanded the right things, have any woman that he wanted, and at the end of the year, he was ceremoniously sacrificed upon a rock, his heart ripped out, his body dismembered, into 14 pieces and scattered over the land. And this is where the legend of the Osirian cycle began. It was to ensure the fertility of the crops of the next year. And young men would volunteer for this in their patriotic duty to their kingdom, to their family so that they could have prosperous years. I'm sorry, I gotta see the hands. I'm not one of them.